So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Unfortunately, Dr. Sunil was to give this presentation. However, because of some emergencies, he is unable to make it today. So I will try my best to give you this perspective. I think let's go to the next slide, please. So I think my, my talk will be basically on, I will be giving you an overview of global vaccine market. Then we will talk about the, how the global vaccine supply is, what is the role of uh, LMAC, especially the DCVMN, which is represented by DCVMN, how, how the supply is. Then we are, we are also going to talk about the DCVMN and the response to the pandemic, which is COVID. And then in brief, we will also touch about the global access. What are the challenges that we faced uh, during the COVID time? Next slide, please. Therefore, if you look at the uh, global vaccine market, I think we are close to almost 100 billion uh, USD, and we are growing very, uh, we are growing at a very positive rate of around around 13 percent, and it is expected that we will continue to grow at this rate, uh, maybe at a rate of 11.7 uh, percent. And this positive growth rate is definitely is because of the rising awareness on immunization and vaccination benefits. The COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic that we saw was the best example now. Uh, where which have raised our awareness on immunization benefits, and it is definitely consistently driving the global vaccine market growth. If you see at the uh, vaccine market level, we could see that the main type of vaccines which we have is single antigen vaccine, we have combination vaccines, we have different pediatric vaccine, we do have adult vaccines. Uh, my previous speakers definitely uh, spoke very well about maternal immunization and, adult, and importance of adult vaccination. That is the area that is the area still we have to uh, have much more improvement on. And then we have now the immunization vaccine agenda, which certainly talks about the increasing the vaccination benefits further to save another 50 million lives uh, by the end of 2030. So I think the industry overall, the global vaccine industry has a very important role to play. And I think uh, as uh, and we can say that the timely vaccine supplies and affordability would be a key drivers to achieve our immunization targets. Next slide. So if we really see a global vaccine supply, I think our industry is, uh, is def definitely divided into two uh, important segments. One is the industry which is based in developed world. And this industry is represented by International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Associations. So this, uh, this federation was, or this association was formed in the year 1968. And this compromised on almost 25 leading international companies based in developed world. As my Previous speaker have made my task very easy. Uh, this industry generally, as as it has been rightly put out, that vaccine development and uh, vaccine is very costly uh, in developed world. So therefore, uh, this industry is much more focused on the products which give them the high uh, the high market uh, uh, high market returns. So definitely, they generate 80 to 85 percent of total revenue in global in global vaccine market. This is the figures that I'm talking pre-pandemic era. Now, now the figures have changed. I think the, the equation is now that 70% of the total revenue is, is definitely governed by the industry based in development. And if you see at the volumes, I think they contribute 12 to 15% in volumes because this industry is now really major focused on the very high cost unit products and not on the EPI vaccines. Uh, so therefore, uh, they contribute less than the volumes, but more uh, revenue is generated out of this 12 to 15 percent volumes. On the other hand, we have the DCOMN country, which is uh, with the, which represent the LMIC uh, industry, which is based in LMIC countries. So this DCOMN was formed in year 2000. Uh, we have almost 41 max vaccine manufacturers, which are based in 14 countries uh, spreading across Latin America, Middle East, and Asia Pacific region. Uh, we supply almost uh, 40 different types of vaccines totaling around 200 products. And most of our vaccine or most of our business model is focused on uh, meeting the EPI supplies or UNICEF uh, targets. We uh, generally, because of the, uh, because of the lower cost of vaccine development in developing countries, so the cost of these vaccines are as relatively lower. And we always say with pride that we have always kept the prices of the traditional vaccines. And now out of few members of DC women, uh, there are few vaccine manufacturers which have, uh, which have gained a lot of knowledge in vaccine development and transfer. And now this uh, few members of DC women are, are now also working on development of much more complex vaccines, which include pneumococcal vaccine, HPV, rotavirus, malaria, and dengue vaccines. Next slide. 
So therefore, just uh, this is just a, a pictorial graph to indicate where are we based. So therefore, we are for, 41 manufacturers uh, representing almost 14 countries and territories. Next slide. So basically, uh, in DCUMN, if you see, we have the uh, vaccine manufacturers, which are mostly major suppliers to WHO for their for their supplies. And you could see that there are on this table, you could see there are 13 different vaccine manufacturers which are pre-qualified by WHO for supply of EPI vaccines. On the on the on the other side of the table, you could see that the vaccines that they supply. You will also note that most of these vaccines are EPI vaccines. And there are a few vaccine manufacturers which, along with this EPI vaccine, are also involved in the manufacturer in manufacture of technically more complex vaccines such as rotavirus, uh, for example, pneumococcal vaccine. Some of the vaccine manufacturers have also worked on seasonal and uh, seasonal uh, influenza. And but majority of uh, the vaccines that this uh, DCUMN manufactures is EPI. And but there are vaccine manufacturers which are also now working on technologically more complex. Next slide. So this uh, this table actually gives you the real contribution of LMIC. I think uh, uh, it is from the time the GCUMN has started the supply of EPI vaccines, we have significantly noted that the vaccination coverage of basic EPI vaccines have shown a significant increase. In this table, you will find uh, that there are vaccines which have coverage of more than 70%, but there are also vaccines where the coverage is still uh, below 50%. For example, take the example of Haemophilus influenza hip vaccine, where the vaccine coverage is now 70%. And also hepatitis B vaccine, which is the, uh, the vaccination coverage is close to 80%. But now we have HTB vaccine, where the coverage is just 15%. The reason of having a low coverage of HTB vaccine is that very few DCOMN manufacturers have this vaccine with them. And, and certainly, the uh, most of the HTB vaccine supply is still coming from developed world and DCUMN is definitely working on on the on this vaccine to increase the vaccination coverage. As uh, as my uh, previous speaker has given a best example of meningitis A vaccine, I think it was through the collaboration of meningitis uh, project where this meningitis A vaccine was developed uh, with, with collaboration with WHO and other international agencies, and DCUMN was able to deliver this uh, vaccine with as uh, as my previous speaker has given you a good perspective of how the market dynamic plays uh, in order to select a good vaccine for development. This vaccine certainly does not fit into this kind of scheme, but however, still the Serum Institute of India and WHO work together to develop this vaccine together. And this vaccine was supplied to the sub-Saharan African countries. And we always say that the uh, meningitis was eradicated by the launch of this vaccine. And almost 350 million people were immunized with MENA vaccine during that, uh, during that project. Take the example of measles. We are touching about uh, the vaccination coverage close to 90%. And the DCMN is major supplier uh, for measles vaccines. And uh, for example, take the example of pneumococcal vaccine. Pneumococcal vaccine is most complex vaccine to manufacture. Uh, we still have uh, vaccine. Uh, we, we still have three or four vaccine manufacturers which are supplying this vaccine. And very soon, I think there are a few uh, vaccine manufacturers from DCMN who are looking forward to have WHO pre-qualification for their vaccine. And it is hopeful that now with the entry of DCMN into pneumococcal vaccine, the vaccination coverage will improve further. We have best example of polio. It was one of the EPI vaccine. You could see the vaccination coverage is close to 81%. And uh, it was because of the push of uh, the, the agencies and the, and the timely supplies by DCMN where we were able to achieve this polio targets in a much more significant fashion. We also have in this list example of yellow fever vaccine, which is again his coverage is forty percent. His coverage is around forty percent, and that uh, exactly fits the example that my colleague uh, cited before my presentation. That though uh, we need this vaccine, but there is no uh, efficient market demand uh, for for this vaccine, and therefore the coverage still remains to be low, as we have very few vaccine manufacturers who really manufacture yellow fever vaccine. Next slide, please. So I think uh, whatever I presented in my last slide, it gives, uh, I think this snapshot really gives you a, a good idea. You could see that in 1970 and 1980s, if you see the, the, the basic axis of uh, the graph, you could see that in 1970 and 1980s, the vaccination coverage was around 20%. And in, during 1980 to 1990, you could see a very uh, high jump in the vaccination coverage 
And this, this is a time when the LMIC uh, industry or the DCMN, DCMN started manufacturing the EPI vaccines. And now we have reached the vaccination coverage around 80% for basic EPI vaccine. And you could also see uh, there are examples of hip vaccine and pneumococcal vaccine, where the vaccination coverage is now picking up because now the LMIC industry, uh, the manufacturers based in LMIC industry have started manufacturing or starting, they have successful vaccines uh, with them. And now you could see that there is an increase in the vaccination coverage. However, in the later part, if you could see on the, on the later uh, graph, we have still vaccines which are technologically more complex to manufacture. For example, we have HPV, we have malaria, we have, uh, we have other vaccines which are still, uh, the vaccination coverage is still is very low. And I think uh, it has been very, very well identified in WHO 2022 report that in order to meet our 2030 targets, these are the vaccines where, uh, where LMS industry has to work along with the partners to increase their vaccination coverage. Can we go to the next slide? So therefore, uh, this is a this is a one of the best example where the LMIC is now, as I told that now few few of the vaccine manufacturers from LMIC are now invested in development of newer and complex vaccine, and this is the one of the best example. I think there are 280 million cases of malaria every year and nearly half a million deaths that we always see in children. There was only one vaccine, well, one malaria vaccine manufactured by GSK was available till date. but now uh, I think uh, the malaria vaccine, one of the one of the DCUN member has now recently licensed a malaria vaccine. The vaccine was licensed just a month back uh, from, from Africa, from Ghana has licensed this vaccine. So this is another malaria vaccine which has got licensed. It is, it is uses a very, uh, very potential adjuvant, which is a matrix M adjuvant. And uh, I've also provided a, a publication reference, which really uh, talks about the efficacy of this vaccine. And it's expected that this vaccine will have definitely a better efficacy than the existing vaccine. Next slide. So this is this was the example where the where the DCMN or LMIC industry is now venturing into uh, the uh, into the development of much more complex vaccine like malaria, and it is again uh, it is always by the collaboration with international agencies like BM, uh, like WHO, PARC, BMGF, and Oxford University have played a very important role for development of this vaccine with LMIC. Certain uh, next example is again HPV vaccine. Now you could see that from uh, from year 2015, uh, uh, you have seen that uh, very few countries have launched, uh, have very few countries have introduced HPV vaccine. The reason was that there were only one or two suppliers. But I think in, in the year 2022 or in the year 2023, you will see uh, one or two vaccine manufacturers from LMS industry uh, will have their uh, HPV vaccine pre-qualified by WHO. And it's expected that once these uh, vaccine manufacturers enter, enter into this supply scenario, the, the supply coverage or the vaccination coverage of this vaccine will increase further. Next slide. This is again, uh, I think we have already, uh, we have seen in uh, the, uh, in this year that uh, since January this year, we have seen that 29 countries have reported cholera cases. I think this is one of the, one, one of the example where the vaccine is available, but uh, there are, there are few, there are very few vaccine manufacturers who manufacture this vaccine. And therefore, uh, we do not have a much more, much more robust market demand for this vaccine. And that is why the vaccination coverage seems to be at low. Next slide, please. This is another example of diphtheria. We are aware that diphtheria is showing a re-emergence in, in different countries. And in this case, uh, the, the challenge is not because of the vaccination coverage. I think it is because of the inadequate immunization. As we all, as we all know, that this vaccine at least need three doses of diphtheria and booster vaccination is required to take care of waning immunity antibody levels. I think the studies have indicated quite well that we will be needing much more boosters in adults to have to stop these outbreaks. And certainly, uh, as my previous speaker said, we need to have now much more focus on adult immunization, which is still uh, lacking in the in LMIC or in developing countries. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is again a measles outbreak. I think this is the uh, this is the disease which got affected uh, because of the COVID, uh, because of the because of the pandemic, where we could see that uh, most of them, uh, our children missed the, missed their vaccination because of the pandemic agenda, and we could see that 
uh, that few of our uh, few millions of our children did not receive their vaccine because of pandemic and then we we saw a lot of measles outbreak i think this was now identified there is a big catch up immunization program which is in progress to catch up these uh, kids which missed their vaccine uh, during pandemic time next slide please so this is uh, this is a big catch up program that i was talking about i think uh, the target is that uh, we want to cover uh, the children who have missed their immunization because of the because of the pandemic i think 40 million children almost missed at least one dose of measles vaccine in year 2000 to 21 alone uh, thanks to the who and partners who are who have planned this big catch up uh, campaign uh, which is again uh, the target is that we want to immunize almost 67 million children needs to be immunized globally to be back on track and i think uh, the lmic industry is contributing significantly uh, to this uh, campaign next slide i think this uh, we can move on to the next slide i think this covers i have already spoken about similarly the yellow fever vaccine i think this is another uh, one of the examples where where there is uh, there is no market demand and therefore there are very few vaccine manufacturers but certainly yellow fever is an issue and uh, i think a uh, few members of uh, dcman is working on this vaccine and it is expected by year 2024 we have one or more yellow fever vaccines getting licensed for mlimc and it is expected that this will definitely uh, take care of the low vaccine coverage or low vaccine availability uh, for this uh, yellow fever vaccine next slide please so therefore uh, just to summarize so dcman and ifma represent the industry which caters to global vaccine supply there is no doubt about it in both the industries uh, based at dcman and ifma have played a significant role in meeting all the global a uh, vaccine supply needs dcman is largely involved in supply of high quality basic yeah vaccines at affordable prices and they have the business models and the production capacities which has led to significant increase in vaccination coverage uh, just uh, just uh, at who and other international agencies such as path gavi bmjf and other the national regulatory agencies have played an important role in the growth of lmic industry especially in making them Uh, especially in supporting them uh, for for the for the to take up the vaccine development of much more complex vaccines such as hip vaccine or pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and now the hpv and malaria vaccine i think uh, the global challenge that we have now that dcman till date have uh, emerged a very critical constituency and has kept the vaccine supply at affordable prices but i think the issue with the industry now will be for how long we can sustain it i think with the increasing uh gmp requirements with the increasing regulatory uh, expectations for how long this this industry can be supported to keep the vaccine supplies at affordable prices next slide please. i think uh, with this i think I'm, i will move on to to the, the second part of my presentation which talks about the roles and contribution of dcm and during covid vaccine next slide please so i think we are aware uh, that a lot of Uh, vaccines were developed in a very short uh, time i think this was the most challenging time that the industry had faced and industry has responded to quite well and lot large number of vaccine candidates were developed were evaluated and the vaccines were launched at at a very at a very fast pace and they, and definitely vaccines were also delivered within uh, within the stipulated time uh, to counter this uh, the covid pandemic and i can we can go to the next slide please i think uh, these are the uh, so so dcman and lms industry also contributed very significantly to covid vaccines uh, in this in this table you could see that there are almost 15 vaccine manufacturers from lms industry which got in, themselves invested uh, into development for development of covid vaccines and you could see uh, on the end there are different vaccine platform in which they were invested so these vaccine platforms range from adenovector to inactivated vaccine to protein vaccines some of the vaccine manufacturers also developed some viral vector vaccine some dna vaccines were developed some of the vaccine manufacturers also developed capacities from tech transfer from the developed vaccine manufacturers for mrna based platform so overall if you really see during this covid time lms industry had an experience and uh, of the all these different platforms and this this our lms industry was able to demonstrate that even with these complex uh, vaccine platforms they were able to develop the vaccine and they were able to deliver the vaccine on a timely basis next slide 
so these are the uh, some of the some of the examples of the importance of tech transfers which played a very important role uh, in the new pandemic on this slide you can see that the uh, the technologies which came from developed world to the cvm for example the adeno vector vaccine or the covid shield vaccine which was developed by serum institute the technology came from astrazeneca uk and that technology was given to or the was shared with uh, to various members of the cvm for example the novavax again uh, the protein based vaccine the tech transfer was given to serum institute of india for protein based vaccine also this technology was also uh, given to aspen uh, pharma which is based at south south africa pfizer definitely uh, gave their tech uh, mrna technology to biovac at south africa similarly moderna had a collaboration with samsung biologics south korea and then jensen and jensen vaccine there was a tech transfer of this vaccine from from us to a company in india which is biology biologics so certainly you can see that uh, that during the pandemic time dcmn or the lms industry was was very proactive in having these technologies developed for their countries and the vaccines were developed and was administered to the populations similarly uh, there was a very significant observation that was also noted that there were few tech transfer from lmic to lmic countries also for example sinovac gave their technology to bhutan and brazil or pt biopharma or, or or in malaysia similarly sinopharm china also gave their technology to companies in indonesia and in dubai and similarly the bharat biotech vaccine at in india gave their technology to one of the vaccine manufacturers in india to boost their vaccine capacity so that more and more people could be immunized in shorter intervals of time next slide so therefore uh, that was the result as you could see that in uh, in year 2021 by december 30, uh, by december 31st 2021 almost 11.3 billion doses of uh, covid vaccines were administered globally and out of that uh, we could we could see with we could say with pride that almost 60% of this total global production was taken care by lmic industry alone thank you next slide please so therefore this brings to my the last part of my presentation which about about the global access to vaccine this is uh, i think uh, we would like to share our experience how how did we because we were also part of lot of vaccine development during pandemic times so this is our perspective of uh, of how how this global access was during the time of covid can go to the next slide please so i think uh, we all are aware that uh, during this covid we certainly see uh, almost 13.2 billion doses of covid vaccines were administered there was increase in vaccine capacity like anything during covid time almost 89% of health workers uh, received their complete primary series across the who levels almost 83% of older adults they completed their primary series across who member states almost if you really see the target wise almost 65% of general population completed their primary series across the state during pandemic however we also know that we also face challenges that the vaccine coverage in lower middle income country was 80% and this really uh, brought uh, the the topic on the vaccine inequity can we go to the next slide i think this generated a lot of discussions of why did it happen why we were not able to deliver the vaccines to the to the lower middle income countries i think this was really put very uh, very forward by who uh, director general that all the vaccine deserve the opportunity uh, to receive a vaccine regardless of their political economic or diplomatic and health related factors and we are also aware that this carries a lot of risk if the the population across the countries are not vaccinated we definitely have a risk of new variants of concern which could emerge because there is a risk of infection uh, in the population which are not vaccinated next slide so therefore a uh, lot of studies were undertaken why this inequality was there i think the most of uh, these studies identified there were three major areas uh, which were studied of why, why this inequality uh, was there during covid crisis was was it a production capacity issue are the vaccines were not available in sufficient numbers or whether this was an allocation issue that the vaccines were available but they were not allocated as they should be or third the vaccines the production capacity was available allocation was also done on time but still the vaccine was could not reach to the to the users next slide please so certainly uh, all the studies done on production capacity do indicate that uh, it is it was not a production capacity issue because currently now also i think the global production capacity of both developed world and developing world if we keep it together we still have a global production capacity of around 1.5 billion doses per month 
and this is enough to uh, achieve WHO targets provided they are uh, distributed equally. For example, take, take, take our example at Students of India. We, we manufactured Covishield vaccine, but now uh, the Covishield facility production facility uh, production facility and capacity is still under utilized because there is no demand of vaccine as of now. Uh, similarly, uh, for, this happened to all the to all the vaccine manufacturers who invested in COVID vaccine. That though they though they were able to scale up their production uh, capacities to a significant amount, but still now uh, the vaccine capacities or vaccine facilities are still under under utilized. So this was we are, we all understand we have already seen in influenza we have seen in manage that pandemic. Uh, vaccines and gas pandemic always has has these challenges. So therefore, the data suggests that production capacity is there. Uh, certainly, then the hypothesis came. Maybe this is an allocation issue. Can can you go to the next slide? Yes, I think uh, during allocation we we certainly faced a lot of challenges. There was a lot of factors which played a role in vaccine allocation. There was nationalistic vaccine policies that the vaccine which is produced in one country, the population was there should receive the vaccine first and then a commitment should come later. There was also a lot of issues that the regulatory uh, requirements across the country were not harmonized. Uh, for example, if I have a vaccine license in India, I have to again, if I want to give this vaccine to Africa, I have to still do one more clinical trial in Africa, then only I'm able to have this vaccine across, delivered to the next, uh, next continent. So the regulatory requirements were not harmonized across. Then certainly there was a vaccine diplomacy also uh, played uh, the factor of vaccine diplomacy was also there during that time, and certainly this uh, rate negatively affected the timelines and vaccine distribution uh, during that time. Next slide, please. So I think another challenge that we also faced uh, as a as as a vaccine manufacturer who was invested in the COVID vaccines that at, at few countries where the the vaccine doses were made available, the, there was a political will. The vaccine uh, doses did reach the countries, but however, those countries did not have the right kind of infrastructure to give these uh, vaccines to their to their to their population. There was lack of trained medical personnel for ensuring fast track immunization. There was inadequate health infrastructure. There were limited capacity for pharmacological vigilance, and certainly in some countries, there was lack of political will for ensuring vaccine coverage and immunization. Next slide. So therefore, uh, all these all these challenges that we face actually have definitely given us a very good policy framework for future pandemic preparedness. There were certainly very important lessons that the industry, the partners, WHO, everyone learned that in order to be prepared for the future pandemics, we certainly have to work on these challenges by ensuring that we certainly have a good production capacity. We have to plug the challenges that we have in vaccine dissemination. And certainly, we also have uh, to work on vaccine deployment. Uh, for 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 fight against the future pandemic uh, as a part of future pandemic preparedness. Next slide, please. So I think uh, both the industries, uh, based and developed world as well as in the in the developing world, have certainly support and endorsed the uh, Berlin Declaration Framework. So this Berlin Declaration Framework uh, was based on five major enablers. Both the industry, based in both the worlds supported that in order to prepare for future pandemic, we definitely have to have a sustainable manufacturing capacity. This will be one of the enabler. Second, we need to have a sustaining fiber innovation ecosystem. WHO has identified a lot of uh, the priority vaccination and priority vaccination which, in which the industry should focus upon. And therefore, we need to generate a good, right kind of innovation ecosystem so that industry can work on these uh, on these targets and have their vaccines or have their platforms in a prepared form. We certainly have to invest in country health system capabilities. I think uh, that is also very much important because that, that system will be important to deliver the vaccine to the desired population. We also need to have a support, a trading environment so that the, the vaccine could free flow among the continent so that vaccine available in one part of the world can reach to the another part of the world in the in best possible time. And definitely, we also need to work on equ equitable access to vaccine so that the allocations uh, could happen in much more equitable manner. Next slide, please. So I think uh, one of the most, most important lessons that we learned is that every country or needs to have their indigenous local vaccine capacity. I think this, that was a, one of the major lessons that were learned. And I think DCOMN and IFMS supports uh, that 
that the local vaccine capacity in LMIC needs to be strengthened. So therefore, both the DCM and IFMI will be is is working together to have this capacity built at LMIC uh, countries. I think this is the this is a very good publication which has come in Lancet, which speaks about uh, this kind of approach where the local vaccine capacity in LMIC needs to be strengthened. Next slide. And some of the uh, most important milestone that I think uh, uh, the one all the lessons that we learned during during pandemic was immediately applied, and uh, I'm I'm happy to share that uh, one of the uh, state of the art construction work on on US dollar one one twenty two million dollar project uh, has already started in Ghana, and this plant will be a state of art plant which will be focusing on uh, development of malaria and COVID vaccine. So I think uh, the all the initiatives have right, have started in the right areas. We are now seeing a lot of investment which is happening in LMSC countries to increase their vac vaccine capacity. Similarly, uh, one of one more initiative which is by uh, CEPI and BMGF, where we we are uh, and along with Serum Institute of India, we are working to have uh, in, to in order to improve the access to vaccine in Africa. We are investing. Uh, we are uh, supporting a tech transfer from Serum Institute of India to SPN. Uh, to SPN company, which is based in Africa, for at least four different vaccines. The tech transfer is happening for four different vaccines so that the capacity can be developed uh, at SPN. The four vaccines include pneumococcal vaccine, which is, again, much more advanced vaccine, rota vaccine, and hexavalent, and the meningococcal conjugate vaccine. So all these four different vaccine tech transfer will be happening from Serum Institute of India to SPN as part of uh, strengthening the local vaccine manufacturing capacity at Africa. Similarly, in Canada, Canada and PAHO is definitely collaborating together to strengthen vaccine manufacturing capacity in Latin America and Caribbean. I think the over there, the focus is that the COVID vaccine manufacturing platform should get uh, built over in, in those areas. Next slide, please. So I think uh, that's come to the, the, the last concluding slide of my presentation. I think DCM and in emerging world have an important play to play in global access to vaccines. The production capacity of these vaccine manufacturers have played a very important role and uh, in order to give equitable access to EPI vaccine. DCMN is, uh, or LMIC has played a very important role during COVID pandemic. And, 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 and there is that the existing production capacity needs to be maintained and strengthened so that this could be used for the future pandemics. And tech transfers and support from international agencies have played a very important role in shaping the LMIC industry or shaping DCMN, and it should be further promoted. And now the, the few of the DCM members have now developed capacities. They can undertake the development and licensure of complex vaccines such as pneumococcal, HPV, or uh, the malaria vaccine, and will be and these capacities or this kind of uh, capacity will be will be playing a very important role in promoting the coverage of such vaccines. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Manish. That was an extremely clear um, uh, summary, and I think we could hear it nice and clear eventually. So thanks for waiting and being patient uh, to make the IT work. If you're okay with it, we'll, we'll take a, a few questions from the audience. So make sure you turn on your uh, microphone, and uh, so we'll go one, two, three. <clears throat> Okay, can you hear me? So it's Christiana Campa, GSK. Do you have a question? No, you I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, you have a broad a set of vaccine types that you have assessed, for instance, for tech transfer, uh, also uh, supply uh, evaluation. So are you planning or have you done a comparative assessment in terms of challenges for the different vaccine types? Because that could help for future pandemic preparedness, right? If you know that there is a particularly problematic a vaccine type versus another, maybe you can already plan to focus on one versus the other. Do you think something doable or are you doing anything on that? So, uh, if I understand correctly, I think uh, you are pointing towards the COVID vaccines and different platforms that yeah, got for evaluated. For COVID, right? The, the table yes. you showed so, for COVID. Exactly. So I think... Uh, we all, as, as an industry, we all are aware that there were very few vaccine platforms that work very successfully. I think mRNA vaccine, adenovector, and inactivated vaccine and protein vaccines were the major leaders who, uh, as, as a technology, who really proved uh, during the COVID pandemic. 
So I think uh, we already have a very good proof of concept for these vaccines in place. And I think these would be the platforms that uh, we should strengthen for future pandemic preparedness. And I, I will also, because I was also part of the, uh, the vaccine, COVID vaccine development, and I could see and I could share with you that uh, such kind of international collaboration uh, was seen. Uh, it was very remarkable. You could see uh, how the CP, how the BMGF, how WHO were, were working day and night to, uh, to evaluate these platforms for us. There was no problem for the reagents. The technologies were shared with on time. There were so many groups which were working with us to, uh, to support this uh, vaccines further. And I think, and, and think now the, the vaccine industry and the research community, we have a very good innovation ecosystem in place to, to really work on these uh, vaccines. Further. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Image Randy from Morocco. Uh, you already answered my question, but I, I will uh, keep uh, my question. Uh, since you you said and you point out that the diplomacy uh, played a very um, high role for vaccine distribution, I was uh, wondering uh, how useful or unuseful was the Doha declaration. Um, I, thanks for the question, but I think uh, I, I will not be a very good expert in uh, in, the, in answering this. Being coming from a vaccine industry, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm really very sorry. I can come back to you on this, but certainly I will not be a very good uh, expert to talk about uh, this. Okay, I'm sorry. no problem. Sorry Maybe that. I will ask someone else. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> yeah, over here. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if you can answer this question or somebody else from the industry or the former uh, speaker. But um, as I learned, the farm, this industry has grown very, very fast, and that's good. And of course, we need to reach everybody. Um, but I was w also wondering, what are the these industries doing about uh, working climate friendly, pollution, these kind of things? Are there also things happening on that part of this industry? Yes, I, I think... Uh... I could speak for 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 my company. I think uh, what we are trying to do is to focus more on disposable technologies. We are moving away from uh, glass-based technologies to more of disposable technologies in order to move uh, for this. We have also uh, certainly invested in a lot of uh, different kind of technologies which could offer us uh, the clean and pollution-free environments. Uh, especially, I think at Serum Institute of India, we are also invested in uh, developing a pandemic facility which will be at one place so that we do not uh, have have to really uh, have more vaccine manufacture bases at different places. So what we are trying to do is that to create one more, one pandemic facility in one facility, which could cater to all kinds of these vaccine platforms. So that's what uh, I could really think of, that these are the steps that our, my company is already taking in this direction. 